Moby Dick. Chapter 81. The Pequod Meets the Virgin. The predestinated day arrived, and we duly met the ship Jungfrau, Derek de Deer, master, of Bremen. At one time the greatest whaling people in the world, the Dutch and Germans, are now among the least, but here and there at very wide intervals of latitude and longitude, you still occasionally meet with their flag in the Pacific. For some reason, the Jungfrau seemed quite eager to pay her respects. While yet some distance from the Pequod, she rounded to, and dropping a boat, her captain was impelled towards us, impatiently standing in the bows instead of the stern. What has he in his hand there, cried Starbuck, pointing to something wavingly held by the German. Impossible, a lamp feeder. Not that, said Stubb, no, no, it's a coffee pot, Mr. Starbuck, he's coming off to make us our coffee, is the Yarman, don't you see that big tin can there alongside of him, that's his boiling water. Oh. He's all right, is the Yarman. Go along with you, cried Flask, it's a lamp feeder and an oil can. He's out of oil, and has come a begging. However curious it may seem for an oil ship to be borrowing oil on the whale ground, and however much it may invertedly contradict the old proverb about carrying coals to Newcastle, yet sometimes such a thing really happens, and in the present case Captain Derek de Deer did indubitably conduct a lamp feeder as Flask did declare. As he mounted the deck, Ahab abruptly accosted him, without at all heeding what he had in his hand, but in his broken lingo, the German soon evinced his complete ignorance of the white whale, immediately turning the conversation to his lamp feeder and oil can, with some remarks touching his having to turn into his hammock at night in profound darkness, his last drop of Bremen oil being gone, and not a single flying fish yet captured to supply the deficiency, concluding by hinting that his ship was indeed what in the fishery is technically called a clean one, that is, an empty one, well deserving the name of Jungfrau or the Virgin. His necessities supplied, Derek departed, but he had not gained his ship's side, when whales were almost simultaneously raised from the mastheads of both vessels, and so eager for the chase was Derek, that without pausing to put his oil can and lamp feeder aboard, he slewed round his boat and made after the leviathan lamp feeders. Now, the game having risen to leeward, he and the other three German boats that soon followed him, had considerably the start of the Pequod's keels. There were eight whales, an average pod. Aware of their danger, they were going all abreast with great speed straight before the wind, rubbing their flanks as closely as so many spans of horses in harness. They left a great, wide wake, as though continually unrolling a great wide parchment upon the sea. Full in this rapid wake, and many fathoms in the rear, swam a huge, humped old bull, which by his comparatively slow progress, as well as by the unusual yellowish incrustations overgrowing him, seemed afflicted with the jaundice, or some other infirmity. Whether this whale belonged to the pod in advance seemed questionable, for it is not customary for such venerable leviathans to be at all social. Nevertheless, he stuck to their wake, though indeed their backwater must have retarded him, because the white bone or swell at his broad muzzle was a dashed one, like the swell formed when two hostile currents meet. His spout was short, slow, and laborious, coming forth with a choking sort of gush and spending itself in torn shreds, followed by strange subterranean commotions in him, which seemed to have egress at his other buried extremity, causing the waters behind him to up-bubble. Who's got some paragoric, said Stubb, he has the stomach ache, I'm afraid. Lord, think of having half an acre of stomach ache. Adverse winds are holding mad Christmas in him, boys. It's the first foul wind I ever knew to blow from astern, but look, did ever whale ya so before? It must be, he's lost his tiller. As an overladen India man bearing down the Hindustan coast with a deckload of frightened horses, careens, berries, rolls, and wallows on her way, so did this old whale heave his aged bulk, and now and then partly turning over on his cumbrous rib ends, expose the cause of his devious wake in the unnatural stump of his starboard fin. Whether he had lost that fin in battle, or had been born without it, it were hard to say. Only wait a bit, old chap, and I'll give ye a sling for that wounded arm, cried Cruel Flask, pointing to the whale line near him. Mind he don't sling thee with it, cried Starbuck. Give way, or the German will have him. With one intent all the combined rival boats were pointed for this one fish, because not only was he the largest, and therefore the most valuable whale, but he was nearest to them, and the other whales were going with such great velocity, moreover, as almost to defy pursuit for the time. At this juncture the Pequod's keels had shot by the three German boats last lowered, but from the great start he had had, Derek's boat still led the chase, though every moment neared by his foreign rivals. The only thing they feared, was, that from being already so nigh to his mark, 
he would be enabled to dart his iron before they could completely overtake and pass him. As for Derek, he seemed quite confident that this would be the case, and occasionally with a deriding gesture shook his lampfeeder at the other boats. The ungracious and ungrateful dog, cried Starbuck, he mocks and dares me with the very poor box I filled for him not five minutes ago. Then in his old intense whisper, give way, greyhounds. Dog to it. I tell you what it is, Menny cried stub to his crew, it's against my religion to get mad, but I'd like to eat that villainous Yarman pull, won't ye? Are ye going to let that rascal beat ye? Do ye love brandy? A hog's head of brandy, then, to the best man. Come, why don't some of ye burst a blood vessel? Who's that been dropping an anchor overboard, we don't budge an inch, we're becalmed. Halloo, here's grass growing in the boat's bottom, and by the lord, the mast there's budding. This won't do, boys. Look at that yarman. The short and long of it is, men, will ye spit fire or not? Oh. See the suds he makes, cried Flask, dancing up and down, what a hump, oh, do pile on the beef, lays like a log. Oh. My lads, do spring the slapjacks and quahogs for supper, you know, my lads, baked clams and muffins, oh, do, do, spring, he's a hundred barreler, don't lose him now, don't, oh, don't, see that yarman, oh, won't you pull for your duff, my lads, such a sog. Such a sogger. Don't ye love sperm? There goes three thousand dollars, men, a bank, a whole bank. The Bank of England, oh, do, 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 what's that yarman about now? At this moment Derek was in the act of pitching his lamp feeder at the advancing boats, and also his oil can, perhaps with the double view of retarding his rival's way, and at the same time economically accelerating his own by the momentary impetus of the backward toss. The unmannerly Dutch dogger, cried Stubb. Pull now, men, like fifty thousand line of battleship loads of red-haired devils. What do ye say, Tashtego, are you the man to snap your spine in two and twenty pieces for the honor of old gayhead? What g say? I say, pull like goddamn, cried the Indian. Fiercely, but evenly incited by the taunts of the German, the Pequod's three boats now began ranging almost abreast, and, so disposed, momentarily neared him. In that fine, loose, chivalrous attitude of the headsman when drawing near to his prey, the three mates stood up proudly, occasionally backing the after oarsman with an exhilarating cry of, there she slides, now. Hurrah for the white ash breeze! Down with the Yarman. Sail over him. But so decided an original start had Derek had, that spite of all their gallantry, he would have proved the victor in this race, had not a righteous judgment descended upon him in a crab which caught the blade of his midship oarsman. While this clumsy lubber was striving to free his white ash, and while, in consequence, Derek's boat was nigh to capsizing, and he thundering away at his men in a mighty rage, that was a good time for Starbuck, Stubb, and Flask. With a shout, they took a mortal start forwards, and slantingly ranged up on the German's quarter. An instant more, and all four boats were diagonically in the whale's immediate wake, while stretching from them, on both sides, was the foaming swell that he made. It was a terrific, most pitiable, and maddening sight. The whale was now going head out, and sending his spout before him in a continual tormented jet, while his one poor fin beat his side in an agony of fright. Now to this hand, now to that, he yawed in his faltering flight, and still at every billow that he broke, he spasmodically sank in the sea, or sideways rolled towards the sky his one beating fin. So have I seen a bird with clipped wing making affrighted broken circles in the air, vainly striving to escape the piratical hawks. But the bird has a voice, and with plaintive cries will make known her fear, but the fear of this vast dumb brute of the sea, was chained up and enchanted in him, he had no voice, save the choking respiration through his spiracle, and this made the sight of him unspeakably pitiable, while still, in his amazing bulk, portcullis jaw, and omnipotent tail, there was enough to appall the stoutest man who so pitted. Seeing now that but a very few moments more would give the Pequod's boats the advantage, and rather than be thus foiled of his game, Derek chose to hazard what to him must have seemed a most unusually long dart, ere the last chance would forever escape. But no sooner did his harpooner stand up for the stroke, then all three tigers, Queequeg, Tashtego, Degu, instinctively sprang to their feet, and standing in a diagonal row, simultaneously pointed their barbs, and darted over the head of the German harpooner, their three Nantucket irons entered the whale. Blinding vapors of foam and white fire. The three boats, in the first fury of the whale's headlong rush, bumped the Germans aside with such force, that both Derek and his baffled harpooner were spilled out, and sailed over by the three flying keels. 
Don't be afraid, my butter boxes, cried Stubb, casting a passing glance upon them as he shot by, you'll be picked up presently, all right, I saw some sharks astern, St. Bernard's dogs, you know, relieve distressed travelers. Hurrah! This is the way to sail now. Every keel a sunbeam. Hurrah, here we go like three tin kettles at the tail of a mad cougar. This puts me in mind of fastening to an elephant in a tilbury on a plane, makes the wheel spokes fly, boys, when you fasten to him that way, and there's danger of being pitched out too, when you strike a hill. Hurrah! This is the way a fellow feels when he's going to Davy Jones all a rush down an endless inclined plane. Hurrah! This whale carries the everlasting mail. But the monster's run was a brief one. Giving a sudden gasp, he tumultuously sounded. With a grating rush, the three lines flew round the loggerheads with such a force as to gouge deep grooves in them, while so fearful were the harpooners that this rapid sounding would soon exhaust the lines, that using all their dexterous might, they caught repeated smoking turns with the rope to hold on, till at last owing to the perpendicular strain from the lead line shocks of the boats, whence the three ropes went straight down into the blue, the gunnels of the bows were almost even with the water, while the three sterns tilted high in the air. And the whale soon ceasing to sound, for some time they remained in that attitude, fearful of expending more line, though the position was a little ticklish. But though boats have been taken down and lost in this way, yet it is this holding on, as it is called, this hooking up by the sharp barbs of his live flesh from the back, this it is that often torments the leviathan into soon rising again to meet the sharp lance of his foes. Yet not to speak of the peril of the thing, it is to be doubted whether this course is always the best, for it is but reasonable to presume that the longer the stricken whale stays under water, the more he is exhausted. Because, owing to the enormous surface of him in a full-grown sperm whale something less than 2,000 square feet, the pressure of the water is immense. We all know what an astonishing atmospheric weight we ourselves stand up under, even here, above ground, in the air, how vast, then, the burden of a whale, bearing on his back a column of 200 fathoms of ocean. It must at least equal the weight of 50 atmospheres. One whaleman has estimated it at the weight of 20 line of battleships, with all their guns, and stores, and men on board. As the three boats lay there on that gently rolling sea, gazing down into its eternal blue noon, and as not a single groan or cry of any sort, nay, not so much as a ripple or a bubble came up from its depths, what landsman would have thought, that beneath all that silence and placidity, the utmost monster of the seas was writhing and wrenching in agony. Not eight inches of perpendicular rope were visible at the bows. Seems it credible that by three such thin threads the great leviathan was suspended like the big weight to an eight-day clock. Suspended? And to what? To three bits of board. Is this the creature of whom it was once so triumphantly said, Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons? Or his head with fish spears? The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold, the spear, the dart, nor the habergen, he esteemeth iron as straw, the arrow cannot make him flee, darts are counted as stubble, he laugheth at the shaking of a spear. This the creature? This he? Oh! That unfulfillments should follow the prophets. For with the strength of a thousand thighs in his tail, Leviathan had run his head under the mountains of the sea, to hide him from the Pequod's fish spears. In that sloping afternoon sunlight, the shadows that the three boats sent down beneath the surface must have been long enough and broad enough to shade half Xerxes' army. Who can tell how appalling to the wounded whale must have been such huge phantoms flitting over his head? Stand by, men, he stirs, cried Starbuck, as the three lines suddenly vibrated in the water, distinctly conducting upwards to them, as by magnetic wires, the life and death throbs of the whale, so that every oarsman felt them in his seat. The next moment, relieved in great part from the downward strain at the bows, the boats gave a sudden bounce upwards, as a small icefield will, when a dense herd of white bears are scared from it into the sea. Haul in! Haul in! cried Starbuck again, he's rising. The lines, of which, hardly an instant before, not one hand's breadth could have been gained, were now in long quick coils flung back all dripping into the boats, and soon the whale broke water within two ship's lengths of the hunters. His motions plainly denoted his extreme exhaustion. In most land animals there are certain valves or floodgates in many of their veins, whereby when wounded, the blood is in some degree at least instantly shut off in certain directions. Not so with the whale, one of whose peculiarities it is to have an entire non-valvular structure of the blood vessels, so that when pierced even by so small a point as a harpoon, a deadly drain is at once begun upon his whole arterial system, 
and when this is heightened by the extraordinary pressure of water at a great distance below the surface, his life may be said to pour from him in incessant streams. Yet so vast is the quantity of blood in him, and so distant and numerous its interior fountains, that he will keep thus bleeding and bleeding for a considerable period, even as in a drought a river will flow, whose source is in the wellsprings of far-off and undiscernible hills. Even now, when the boats pulled upon this whale, and perilously drew over his swaying flukes, and the lances were darted into him, they were followed by steady jets from the new-made wound, which kept continually playing, while the natural spout hole in his head was only at intervals, however rapid, sending its affrighted moisture into the air. From this last vent no blood yet came, because no vital part of him had thus far been struck. His life, as they significantly call it, was untouched. As the boats now more closely surrounded him, the whole upper part of his form, with much of it that is ordinarily submerged, was plainly revealed. His eyes, or rather the places where his eyes had been, were beheld. As strange misgrown masses gather in the knotholes of the noblest oaks when prostrate, so from the points which the whale's eyes had once occupied, now protruded blind bulbs, horribly pitiable to see. But pity there was none. For all his old age, and his one arm, and his blind eyes, he must die the death and be murdered, in order to light the gay bridles and other merrymakings of men, and also to illuminate the solemn churches that preach unconditional inoffensiveness by all to all. Still rolling in his blood, at last he partially disclosed a strangely discolored bunch or protuberance, the size of a bushel, low down on the flank. A nice spot, cried Flask, just let me prick him there once. A vast, cried Starbuck, there's no need of that. But humane Starbuck was too late. At the instant of the dart an ulcerous jet shot from this cruel wound, and goaded by it into more than sufferable anguish, the whale now spouting thick blood, with swift fury blindly darted at the craft, bespattering them and their glory and crews all over with showers of gore, capsizing Flask's boat and marring the bows. It was his death stroke. For, by this time, so spent was he by loss of blood, that he helplessly rolled away from the wreck he had made, lay panting on his side, impotently flapped with his stumped fin, then over and over slowly revolved like a waning world, turned up the white secrets of his belly, lay like a log, and died. It was most piteous, that last expiring spout. As when by unseen hands the water is gradually drawn off from some mighty fountain, and with half-stifled melancholy gurglings the spray column lowers and lowers to the ground so the last long-dying spout of the whale. Soon, while the crews were awaiting the arrival of the ship, the body showed symptoms of sinking with all its treasures unrifled. Immediately, by Starbuck's orders, lines were secured to it at different points, so that ere long every boat was a buoy, the sunken whale being suspended a few inches beneath them by the cords. By very heedful management, when the ship drew nigh, the whale was transferred to her side, and was strongly secured there by the stiffest fluke chains, for it was plain that unless artificially upheld, the body would at once sink to the bottom. It so chanced that almost upon first cutting into him with the spade, the entire length of a corroded harpoon was found embedded in his flesh, on the lower part of the bunch before described. But as the stumps of harpoons are frequently found in the dead bodies of captured whales, with the flesh perfectly healed around them, and no prominence of any kind to denote their place, therefore, there must needs have been some other unknown reason in the present case fully to account for the ulceration alluded to. But still more curious was the fact of a lance head of stone being found in him, not far from the buried iron, the flesh perfectly firm about it. Who had darted that stone lance? And when? It might have been darted by some nor West Indian long before America was discovered. What other marbles might have been rummaged out of this monstrous cabinet there is no telling. But a sudden stop was put to further discoveries, by the ships being unprecedentedly dragged over sideways to the sea, owing to the body's immensely increasing tendency to sink. However, Starbuck, who had the ordering of affairs, hung on to it to the last, hung on to it so resolutely, indeed, that when at length the ship would have been capsized, if still persisting in locking arms with the body, then, when the command was given to break clear from it, such was the immovable strain upon the timber heads to which the fluke chains and cables were fastened, that it was impossible to cast them off. Meantime everything in the Pequot was a slant. To cross to the other side of the deck was like walking up the steep gabled roof of a house. The ship groaned and gasped. Many of the ivory inlayings of her bulwarks and cabins were started from their places, by the unnatural dislocation. In vain handspikes and crows were brought to bear upon the immovable flute chains, to pry them adrift from the timberheads, and so low had the whale now settled that the submerged ends could not be at all approached, while every moment whole tons of ponderosity seemed added to the sinking bulk, 
and the ship seemed on the point of going over. Hold on, hold on, won't ye, cried Stubb to the body, don't be in such a devil of a hurry to sink. By thunder, men, we must do something, or go for it. No use prying there, avast, I say with your hand spikes, and run one of ye for a prayer book and a penknife, and cut the big chains. Knife? I, I, cried Creekwig, and seizing the carpenter's heavy hatchet, he leaned out of a porthole, and steel to iron, began slashing at the largest flute chains. But a few strokes, full of sparks, were given, when the exceeding strain affected the rest. With a terrific snap, every fastening went adrift, the ship righted, the carcass sank. Now, this occasional inevitable sinking of the recently killed sperm whale is a very curious thing, nor has any fisherman yet adequately accounted for it. Usually the dead sperm whale floats with great buoyancy, with its side or belly considerably elevated above the surface. If the only whales that thus sank were old, meager, and broken-hearted creatures, their pads of lard diminished and all their bones heavy and rheumatic, then you might with some reason assert that this sinking is caused by an uncommon specific gravity in the fish so sinking, consequent upon this absence of buoyant matter in him. But it is not so. For young whales, in the highest health, and swelling with noble aspirations, prematurely cut off in the warm flush and may of life, with all their panting lard about them, even these brawny, buoyant heroes do sometimes sink. Be it said, however, that the sperm whale is far less liable to this accident than any other species. Where one of that sort go down, twenty right whales do. This difference in the species is no doubt imputable in no small degree to the greater quantity of bone in the right whale, his Venetian blinds alone sometimes weighing more than a ton, from this encumbrance the sperm whale is wholly free. But there are instances where, after the lapse of many hours or several days, the sunken whale again rises, more buoyant than in life. But the reason of this is obvious. Gases are generated in him, he swells to a prodigious magnitude, becomes a sort of animal balloon. A line of battleship could hardly keep him under then. In the shore whaling, on soundings, among the bays of New Zealand, when a right whale gives token of sinking, they fasten buoys to him, with plenty of rope, so that when the body has gone down, they know where to look for it when it shall have ascended again. It was not long after the sinking of the body that a cry was heard from the Pequod's mastheads, announcing that the Jungfrau was again lowering her boats, though the only spot in sight was that of a fin back, belonging to the species of uncapturable whales, because of its incredible power of swimming. Nevertheless, the finback spout is so similar to the sperm whales, that by unskillful fishermen it is often mistaken for it. And consequently Derek and all his host were now in valiant chase of this unnearable brute. The virgin crowding all sail, made after her four young keels, and thus they all disappeared far to leeward, still in bold, hopeful chase. Oh! Many are the finbacks, and many are the Derricks, my friend. Chapter 82 The Honor and Glory of Whaling There are some enterprises in which a careful disorderliness is the true method. The more I dive into this matter of whaling, and push my researches up to the very springhead of it so much the more am I impressed with its great honorableness and antiquity, and especially when I find so many great demigods and heroes, prophets of all sorts, who one way or other have shed distinction upon it, I am transported with the reflection that I myself belong, though but subordinately, to so emblazoned a fraternity. The gallant Perseus, a son of Jupiter, was the first whaleman, and to the eternal honor of our calling be it said, that the first whale attacked by our brotherhood was not killed with any sordid intent. Those were the nightly days of our profession, when we only bore arms to succor the distressed, and not to fill men's lamp feeders. Everyone knows the fine story of Perseus and Andromeda, how the lovely Andromeda, the daughter of a king, was tied to a rock on the seacoast, and as Leviathan was in the very act of carrying her off, Perseus, the prince of whalemen, intrepidly advancing, harpooned the monster, and delivered and married the maid. It was an admirable artistic exploit, rarely achieved by the best harpooners of the present day, inasmuch as this Leviathan was slain at the very first dart. And let no man doubt this archite story, for in the ancient Joppa, now Jaffa, on the Syrian coast, in one of the pagan temples, there stood for many ages the vast skeleton of a whale, which the city's legends and all the inhabitants asserted to be the identical bones of the monster that Perseus slew. When the Romans took Joppa, the same skeleton was carried to Italy in triumph. What seems most singular and suggestively important in this story, is this, it was from Joppa that Jonah set sail. Akin to the adventure of Perseus and Andromeda, indeed, by some supposed to be indirectly derived from it, is that famous story of St. George and the Dragon, which Dragon I maintain to have been a whale, 
for in many old chronicles whales and dragons are strangely jumbled together, and often stand for each other. Thou art as a lion of the waters, and as a dragon of the sea, saith Ezekiel, hereby, plainly meaning a whale, in truth, some versions of the Bible use that word itself. Besides, it would much subtract from the glory of the exploited St. George but encountered a crawling reptile of the land, instead of doing battle with the great monster of the deep. Any man may kill a snake, but only a Perseus, a St. George, a coffin, have the heart in them to march boldly up to a whale. Let not the modern paintings of this scene mislead us, for though the creature encountered by that valiant whaleman of old is vaguely represented of a griffin-like shape, and though the battle is depicted on land and the saint on horseback, yet considering the great ignorance of those times, when the true form of the whale was unknown to artists, and considering that as in Perseus' case, St. George's whale might have crawled up out of the sea on the beach, and considering that the animal ridden by St. George might have been only a large seal or seahorse, bearing all this in mind, it will not appear altogether incompatible with the sacred legend and the ancientest drafts of the scene, to hold this so-called dragon no other than the great Leviathan himself. In fact, placed before the strict and piercing truth, this whole story will fare like that fish, flesh, and foul idol of the Philistines, Dagon by name, who being planted before the Ark of Israel, his horse's head and both the palms of his hands fell off from him, and only the stump or fishy part of him remained. Thus, then, one of our own noble stamp, even a whaleman, is the tutelary guardian of England, and by good rights, we harpooners of Nantucket should be enrolled in the most noble order of St. George. And therefore, let not the knights of that honorable company, none of whom, I venture to say, have ever had to do with a whale like their great patron, let them never eye an Nantucketer with disdain, since even in our woolen frocks and tarred trousers we are much better entitled to St. George's decoration than they. Whether to admit Hercules among us or not, concerning this I long remained dubious, for though according to the Greek mythologies, that antique Crockett and Kit Carson, the brawny doer of rejoicing good deeds, was swallowed down and thrown up by a whale, still, whether that strictly makes a whaleman of him, that might be mooted. It nowhere appears that he ever actually harpooned his fish, unless, indeed, from the inside. Nevertheless, he may be deemed a sort of involuntary whaleman, at any rate the whale caught him, if he did not the whale. I claim him for one of our clan. But, by the best contradictory authorities, this Grecian story of Hercules and the whale is considered to be derived from the still more ancient Hebrew story of Jonah and the whale, and vice versa, certainly they are very similar. If I claim the demigod then, why not the prophet? Nor do heroes, saints, demigods, and prophets alone comprise the whole role of our order. Our grand master is still to be named, for like royal kings of old times, we find the headwaters of our fraternity in nothing short of the great gods themselves. That wondrous oriental story is now to be rehearsed from the Shastra, which gives us the dread Vishnu, one of the three persons in the godhead of the Hindus, gives us this divine Vishnu himself for our lord, Vishnu, who, by the first of his ten earthly incarnations, has forever set apart and sanctified the whale. When Brahma, or the god of gods, set the Shastra, resolved to recreate the world after one of its periodical dissolutions, he gave birth to Vishnu, to preside over the work, but the Vedas, or mystical books, whose perusal would seem to have been indispensable to Vishnu before beginning the creation, and which therefore must have contained something in the shape of practical hints to young architects, these Vedas were lying at the bottom of the waters, so Vishnu became incarnate in a whale. And sounding down in him to the uttermost depths, rescued the sacred volumes. Was not this Vishnu a whaleman, then? Even as a man who rides a horse is called a horseman? Perseus, St. George, Hercules, Jonah, and Vishnu. There's a member role for you. What club but the whalemans can head off like that? Chapter 83 Jonah Historically Regarded Reference was made to the historical story of Jonah and the whale in the preceding chapter. Now some Nantucketers rather distrust this historical story of Jonah and the whale. But then there were some skeptical Greeks and Romans, who, standing out from the orthodox pagans of their times, equally doubted the story of Hercules and the whale, and Arion and the dolphin, and yet their doubting those traditions did not make those traditions one with the less facts, for all that. One old Sag Harbor whaleman's chief reason for questioning the Hebrew story was this, he had one of those quaint old-fashioned Bibles, embellished with curious, unscientific plates, one of which represented Jonah's whale with two spouts in his head a peculiarity only true with respect to a species of the Leviathan, the right whale, and the varieties of that order, concerning which the fishermen have this saying, a penny roll would choke him, his swallow is so very small. But, to this, 
Bishop Jeb's anticipative answer is ready. It is not necessary, hence the bishop, that we consider Jonah as tombed in the whale's belly, but is temporarily lodged in some part of his mouth. And this seems reasonable enough in the good bishop. For truly, the right whale's mouth would accommodate a couple of whist tables and comfortably seat all the players. Possibly, too, Jonah might have ensconced himself in a hollow tooth, but, on second thoughts, the right whale is toothless. Another reason which Sag Harbor, he went by that name, urged for his want of faith in this matter of the prophet, was something obscurely in reference to his incarcerated body and the whale's gastric juices. But this objection likewise falls to the ground, because a German exegetist supposes that Jonah must have taken refuge in the floating body of a dead whale even as the French soldiers in the Russian campaign turned their dead horses into tents and crawled into them. Besides, it has been divined by other continental commentators that when Jonah was thrown overboard from the Joppa ship, he straightway effected his escape to another vessel nearby, some vessel with a whale for a figurehead, and, I would add, possibly called the whale, as some craft are nowadays christened the shark, the gull, the eagle. Nor have there been wanting learned exegetists who have opined that the whale mentioned in the book of Jonah merely meant a life preserver an inflated bag of wind which the endangered prophet swam to, and so was saved from a watery doom. Poor Seg Harbor, therefore, seems worsted all round. But he had still another reason for his want of faith. It was this, if I remember right, Jonah was swallowed by the whale in the Mediterranean Sea, and after three days he was vomited up somewhere within three days' journey of Nineveh, a city on the Tigris, very much more than three days' journey across from the nearest point of the Mediterranean coast. How is that? But was there no other way for the whale to land the prophet within that short distance of Nineveh? Yes. He might have carried him round by the way of the Cape of Good Hope. But not to speak of the passage through the whole length of the Mediterranean and another passage up the Persian Gulf and Red Sea, such a supposition would involve the complete circumnavigation of all Africa in three days, not to speak of the Tigris waters, near the site of Nineveh, being too shallow for any whale to swim in. Besides, this idea of Jonah's weathering the Cape of Good Hope at so early a day would rest the honor of the discovery of that great headland from Bartholomew Diaz, its reputed discoverer, and so make modern history a liar. But all these foolish arguments of old Sag Harbor only evinced his foolish pride of reason, a thing still more reprehensible in him, seeing that he had but little learning except what he had picked up from the sun and the sea. I say it only shows his foolish, impious pride, an abominable, devilish rebellion against the reverend clergy. For by a Portuguese Catholic priest, this very idea of Jonah's going to Nineveh via the Cape of Good Hope was advanced as a signal magnification of the general miracle. And so it was. Besides, to this day, the highly enlightened Turks devoutly believe in the historical story of Jonah. And some three centuries ago, an English traveler in old Harris's voyages speaks of a Turkish mosque built in honor of Jonah, in which mosque was a miraculous lamp that burnt without any oil. Chapter 84. Pitch Poling. To make them run easily and swiftly, the axles of carriages are anointed, and for much the same purpose, some whalers perform an analogous operation upon their boat, they grease the bottom. Nor is it to be doubted that as such a procedure can do no harm, it may possibly be of no contemptible advantage, considering that oil and water are hostile, that oil is a sliding thing, and that the object in view is to make the boat slide bravely. Queequeg believed strongly in anointing his boat, and one morning not long after the German ship Jungfrau disappeared, took more than customary pains in that occupation, crawling under its bottom, where it hung over the side, and rubbing in the unctuousness as though diligently seeking to ensure a crop of hair from the craft's bald keel. He seemed to be working in obedience to some particular presentiment. Nor did it remain unwarranted by the event. Towards noon whales were raised, but so soon as the ship sailed down to them, they turned and fled with swift precipitancy, a disordered flight, as of Cleopatra's barges from Actium. Nevertheless, the boats pursued, and Stubbs was foremost. By great exertion, Tashtego at last succeeded in planting one iron, but the stricken whale, without at all sounding, still continued his horizontal flight, with added fleetness. Such unintermitted strainings upon the planted iron must sooner or later inevitably extract it. It became imperative to lance the flying whale, or be content to lose him. But to haul the boat up to his flank was impossible, he swam so fast and furious. What then remained? Of all the wondrous devices and dexterities, the sleights of hand and countless subtleties, to which the veteran whaleman is so often forced, none exceed that fine maneuver with the lance called pitch-pulling. 
small sword, or broad sword, in all its exercises boasts nothing like it. It is only indispensable with an inveterate running whale, its grand fact and feature is the wonderful distance to which the long lance is accurately darted from a violently rocking, jerking boat, under extreme headway. Steel and wood included, the entire spear is some 10 or 12 feet in length, the staff is much slighter than that of the harpoon, and also of a lighter material, pine. It is furnished with a small rope called a warp, of considerable length, by which it can be hauled back to the hand after darting. But before going further, it is important to mention here, that though the harpoon may be pitch-pulled in the same way with the lance, yet it is seldom done, and when done, is still less frequently successful, on account of the greater weight and inferior length of the harpoon as compared with the lance, which in effect becomes serious drawbacks. As a general thing, therefore, you must first get fast to a whale, before any pitch-pulling comes into play. Look now at Stubb, a man who from his humorous, deliberate coolness and equanimity in the direst emergencies, was specially qualified to excel in pitch polling. Look at him, he stands upright in the tossed bow of the flying boat, wrapped in fleecy foam, the towing whale is forty feet ahead. Handling the long lance lightly, glancing twice or thrice along its length to see if it be exactly straight, Stubb whistlingly gathers up the coil of the warp in one hand, so as to secure its free end in his grasp, leaving the rest unobstructed. Then holding the lance full before his waistband's middle, he levels it at the whale, when, covering him with it, he steadily depresses the butt end in his hand, thereby elevating the point till the weapon stands fairly balanced upon his palm, fifteen feet in the air. He minds you somewhat of a juggler, balancing a long staff on his chin. Next moment, with a rapid, nameless impulse, in a superb lofty arch the bright steel spans the foaming distance, and quivers in the life spot of the whale. Instead of sparkling water, he now spouts red blood. That drove the spigot out of him, cried Stubb. Tis July's immortal fourth, all fountains must run wine today. Would now, it were old Orleans whiskey, or old Ohio, or unspeakable old Monongahela. Then, Tashtego, lad, I'd have ye hold a can akin to the jet, and we'd drink round it. Yeah, verily, hearts alive, we'd brew choice punch in the spread of his spout hole there, and from that live punch bowl quaff the living stuff. Again and again to such gamesome talk, the dexterous dart is repeated, the spear returning to its master like a greyhound held in skillful leash. The agonized whale goes into his flurry, the towline is slackened, and the pitch puller dropping astern, folds his hands, and mutely watches the monster die. Chapter 85 The Fountain That for six thousand years, and no one knows how many millions of ages before, the great whales should have been spouting all over the sea, and sprinkling and mystifying the gardens of the deep, as with so many sprinkling or mystifying pots, and that for some centuries back, thousands of hunters should have been close by the fountain of the whale, watching these sprinklings and spoutings, that all this should be, and yet, that down to this blessed minute, fifteen and a quarter minutes past one. A clock p.m. of the 16th day of December, A.D. 1851, it should still remain a problem, whether these spoutings are, after all, really water, or nothing but vapor, this is surely a noteworthy thing. Let us, then, look at this matter, along with some interesting items contingent. Everyone knows that by the peculiar cunning of their gills, the finny tribes in general breathe the air which at all times is combined with the element in which they swim, hence, a herring or a cod might live a century, and never once raise its head above the surface. But owing to his marked internal structure which gives him regular lungs, like a human being's, the whale can only live by inhaling the disengaged air in the open atmosphere. Wherefore the necessity for his periodical visits to the upper world. But he cannot in any degree breathe through his mouth, for, in his ordinary attitude, the sperm whale's mouth is buried at least eight feet beneath the surface, and what is still more, his windpipe has no connection with his mouth. No, he breathes through his spiracle alone, and this is on the top of his head. If I say, that in any creature breathing is only a function indispensable to vitality, inasmuch as it withdraws from the air a certain element, which being subsequently brought into contact with the blood imparts to the blood its vivifying principle, I do not think I shall err, though I may possibly use some superfluous scientific words. Assume it, and it follows that if all the blood in a man could be aerated with one breath, he might then seal up his nostrils and not fetch another for a considerable time. That is to say, he would then live without breathing. Anomalous as it may seem, this is precisely the case with the whale, who systematically lives, by intervals, his full hour and more, when at the bottom, without drawing a single breath, or so much as in any way inhaling a particle of air, for, remember, he has no gills. How is this? 
Between his ribs and on each side of his spine he is supplied with a remarkable involved Cretan labyrinth of vermicelli-like vessels, which vessels, when he quits the surface, are completely distended with oxygenated blood. So that for an hour or more, a thousand fathoms in the sea, he carries a surplus stock of vitality in him, just as the camel crossing the waterless desert carries a surplus supply of drink for future use in its four supplementary stomachs. The anatomical fact of this labyrinth is indisputable, and that the supposition founded upon it is reasonable and true, seems the more cogent to me, when I consider the otherwise inexplicable obstinacy of that leviathan in having his spoutings out, as the fishermen phrase it. This is what I mean. If unmolested, upon rising to the surface, the sperm whale will continue there for a period of time exactly uniform with all his other unmolested risings. Say he stays 11 minutes, and jets 70 times, that is, respires 70 breaths, then whenever he rises again, he will be sure to have his 70 breaths over again, to a minute. Now, if after he fetches a few breaths you alarm him, so that he sounds, he will be always dodging up again to make good his regular allowance of air. And not till those 70 breaths are told, will he finally go down to stay out his full term below. Remark, however, that in different individuals these rates are different, but in anyone they are alike. Now, why should the whale thus insist upon having his spoutings out, unless it be to replenish his reservoir of air, air descending for good? How obvious is it, too, that this necessity for the whale's rising exposes him to all the fatal hazards of the chase? For not by hook or by net could this vast leviathan be caught, when sailing a thousand fathoms beneath the sunlight. Not so much thy skill, then, O hunter, as the great necessities that strike the victory to thee. In man, breathing is incessantly going on one breath only serving for two or three pulsations, so that whatever other business he has to attend to, waking or sleeping, breathe he must, or die he will. But the sperm whale only breathes about one-seventh or Sunday of his time. It has been said that the whale only breathes through his spout hole, if it could truthfully be added that his spouts are mixed with water, then I opine we should be furnished with the reason why his sense of smell seems obliterated in him, for the only thing about him that it all answers to his nose is that identical spout hole, and being so clogged with two elements, it could not be expected to have the power of smelling. But owing to the mystery of the spout, whether it be water or whether it be vapor, no absolute certainty can as yet be arrived at on this head. Sure it is, nevertheless, that the sperm whale has no proper olfactories. But what does he want of them? No roses, no violets, no cologne water in the sea. Furthermore, as his windpipe solely opens into the tube of his spouting canal, and as that long canal, like the Grand Erie Canal, is furnished with a sort of locks, that open and shut, for the downward retention of air or the upward exclusion of water, therefore the whale has no voice, unless you insult him by saying, that when he so strangely rumbles, he talks through his nose. But then again, what has the whale to say? Seldom have I known any profound being that had anything to say to this world, unless forced to stammer out something by way of getting a living. Oh! Happy that the world is such an excellent listener. Now, the spouting canal of the sperm whale, chiefly intended as it is for the conveyance of air, and for several feet laid along, horizontally, just beneath the upper surface of his head, and a little to one side, this curious canal is very much like a gas pipe laid down in a city on one side of a street. But the question returns whether this gas pipe is also a water pipe, in other words, whether the spout of the sperm whale is the mere vapor of the exhaled breath, or whether that exhaled breath is mixed with water taken in at the mouth, and discharged through the spiracle. It is certain that the mouth indirectly communicates with the spouting canal, but it cannot be proved that this is for the purpose of discharging water through the spiracle. Because the greatest necessity for so doing would seem to be, when in feeding he accidentally takes in water. But the sperm whale's food is far beneath the surface, and there he cannot spout even if he would. Besides, if you regard him very closely, and time him with your watch, you will find that when unmolested, there is an undeviating rhyme between the periods of his jets and the ordinary periods of respiration. But why pester one with all this reasoning on the subject? Speak out. You have seen him spout, then declare what the spout is, can you not tell water from air? My dear sir, in this world it is not so easy to settle these plain things. I have ever found your plain things the naughtiest of all. And as for this whale spout, you might almost stand in it, and yet be undecided as to what it is precisely. The central body of it is hidden in the snowy sparkling mist enveloping it, and how can you certainly tell whether any water falls from it, when, always, when you are close enough to a whale to get a close view of his spout, 
he is in a prodigious commotion, the water cascading all around him. And if at such times you should think that you really perceive drops of moisture in the spout, how do you know that they are not merely condensed from its vapor, or how do you know that they are not those identical drops superficially lodged in the spout hole fissure, which is countersunk into the summit of the whale's head? For even when tranquilly swimming through the midday sea in a calm, with his elevated hump sundried as a dromedaries in the desert, even then, the whale always carries a small basin of water on his head, as under a blazing sun you will sometimes see a cavity in a rock filled up with rain. Nor is it at all prudent for the hunter to be over-curious touching the precise nature of the whale spout. It will not do for him to be peering into it and putting his face in it. You cannot go with your pitcher to this fountain and fill it and bring it away. For even when coming into slight contact with the outer, vapory shreds of the jet, which will often happen, your skin will feverishly smart from the acridness of the thing so touching it. And I know one who coming into still closer contact with the spout, whether with some scientific object in view, or otherwise, I cannot say, the skin peeled off from his cheek and arm. Wherefore, among whalemen, the spout is deemed poisonous, they try to evade it. Another thing, I have heard it said, and I do not much doubt it, that if the jet is fairly spouted into your eyes, it will blind you. The wisest thing the investigator can do then, it seems to me, is to let this deadly spout alone. Still, we can hypothesize, even if we cannot prove and establish. My hypothesis is this, that the spout is nothing but mist. And besides other reasons, to this conclusion I am impelled, by considerations touching the great inherent dignity and sublimity of the sperm whale, I account him no common, shallow being, inasmuch as it is an undisputed fact that he is never found on soundings, or near shores, all other whales sometimes are. He is both ponderous and profound. And I am convinced that from the heads of all ponderous profound beings, such as Plato, Pyro, the Devil, Jupiter, Dante, and so on, there always goes up a certain semi-visible steam, while in the act of thinking deep thoughts. While composing a little treatise on eternity, I had the curiosity to place a mirror before me, and ere long saw reflected there, a curious involved worming and undulation in the atmosphere over my head. The invariable moisture of my hair, while plunged in deep thought, after six cups of hot tea in my thin shingled attic, of an August noon, this seems an additional argument for the above supposition. And how nobly it raises our conceit of the mighty, misty monster, to behold him solemnly sailing through a calm tropical sea, his vast, mild head overhung by a canopy of vapor, engendered by his incommunicable contemplations, and that vapor, as you will sometimes see it, glorified by a rainbow, as if heaven itself had put its seal upon his thoughts. For, D.C., rainbows do not visit the clear air, they only irradiate vapor. And so, through all the thick mists of the dim doubts in my mind, divine intuitions now and then shoot, enkindling my fog with a heavenly ray. And for this I thank God, for all have doubts, many deny, but doubts or denials, few along with them, have intuitions. Doubts of all things earthly, and intuitions of some things heavenly, this combination makes neither believer nor infidel, but makes a man who regards them both with equal eye.